Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another um, uh, lecture in, in our series of Dean's Lectures that are organized to recognize and celebrate newly appointed or not so newly appointed and promoted professors. Um, our special guest today was promoted, I guess, over a year ago. But we're, you know, we're a little bit behind in this cycle, so we're, we're catching up. Um, but as you know, earning the rank of professor at the Bloomberg School represents an incredible achievement um, and confirms the respect um, of the professor, not only in the Hopkins community, but around the world. And we're thrilled today to um, uh, honor Dr. S uh, Saifuddin Ahmed um, to uh, professor um, in the School of Public Health. As you'll hear today, Dr. Ahmed's research uh, is in the estimation of uh, maternal mortality and morbidity in resource-poor countries, examination of, of the impact of family planning um, on women's health, and investigation of women's access to reproductive choice. After earning a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery from Dhaka uh, Medical College in Bangladesh in 1982, he was a medical officer and um, assistant surgeon at Dhaka Medical College uh, Hospital from uh, 82 to 84. After receiving his medical training, he uh, served as deputy director of research at the Bangladesh Institute of Research for promotion of essential and reproductive health and technology. He then um, uh, was smart to journey here to Baltimore and came to the Bloomberg School of Public Health and earned his PhD um, and his postdoctoral fellowship in the department of the old Department of Population uh, Dynamics. And soon thereafter, he was appointed uh, to the faculty in that department. Working his way through the ranks, Dr. Ahmed was promoted to professor of the new um, Population, Family, and Reproductive Health in 2016. He also holds a very um, uh, active uh, joint appointment in the Department of Biostatistics. Dr. Ahmed has served as technical advisor and consultant for WHO, the World Bank, uh, African Development Bank, and Catholic Relief Services, among many other organizations. And he currently serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of, um, of Health, Population, and Nutrition. He has received several awards um, in recognition of his many uh, contributions to the field. And most recently, he was invited to give um, the Begum Safin Kamal Lecture Hope I didn't destroy that too badly um, at Dhaka University. He has also been honored here twice um, with the Advising, Mentoring, and Teaching Award uh, from our Student Assembly. So please join me in welcoming Professor Saifuddin Ahmed. Thank you, Dean. Um, Ellen McKenzie, and I thank you all for coming to this session. Saving lives millions at a time. This is not just a slogan. This is the fundamental core of our public health. We like to save lives. We like to prevent the death. No, death is not just a tragedy for the family. Death essentially is the main preventable factors that we always try to address. No death is more preventable than the maternal deaths. When you consider the maternal death, 99% of those maternal deaths occur in developing countries. And as I will show you, if you look at the world trend in the maternal mortality ratio, the maternal mortality ratio from the 1990 it went down from the 384 to 216. A 44% reduction occurred when we promised of the MDG Millennium Development Goal of reducing maternal mortality to 75%. We couldn't do it. We've only reduced 44%. Now, if you compare with the United States, on the other hand, has a maternal mortality ratio hovering around 11 to 40, all alone from 1986. And I will show you even much beyond that period of time. If you consider that world rate is much more higher, look at the sub-Saharan African country where the maternal mortality rates stand. 
it is still at 2015 more than 500 maternal deaths occurring in sub-saharan african country if we consider the 14 is too low look at finland maternal mortality is even lower 4 per 100000 women compared to africa where it is more than 500 per 100000 live birth if you look at the left hand side graph showing from the 1915 maternal mortality ratio up to the 1980 and this is the maternal mortality trend in the usa in 1915 it was around 600 essentially which was close to now in many african countries look at in 1950 but if you look at the 1940 when the second world war was going on at the same time look at how fast the maternal mortality reduction occurred in the united states and it has almost reached to the very low level and from the 1970 1980 it almost reached the same level of hovering less than 20 per 100000 live birth now i really said this graph is a some sort of a hope and some sort of a lesson learning what is the hope hope is that maternal mortality could be reduced very sharply if we want to on the other hand it also shows in the united states maternal mortality was estimated in 1915 even before that on the other hand even now in many developing countries we cannot estimate we cannot calculate maternal mortality from their own empirical data they don't have the data and the graph i have shown on the right side most of these estimations are based on the model based estimations in fact one day after the publication of where m is in the mch where is the mother in maternal and child health in 1987 by the allen rosenfield the interest in maternal health emerged 1987 we have the safe motherhood initiative in nairobi kenya since then only interest in maternal mortality emerged for the developing countries very first time maternal mortality estimation started in developing countries around that period 1990 before that we do not have any idea what was the maternal mortality ratio we don't know if the united states could do it more than 100 years back still many developing countries cannot do it if you have a cell phone even apple x you can immediately find it in the developing country but not we could not still transfer this health technology to this developing countries in fact john sopkins university has a long tradition of estimating maternal mortality if we look at this report revised 1990 estimation the as i said earlier maternal mortality estimation was first estimated globally from the 1990 and it was done by Johns Hopkins School of Public Health faculty Kenneth Hill professor from population dynamics department so and uh, 1991 was the very first who book came out on the maternal mortality before that absolutely there was no information at the national level on maternal mortality globally or any at the country level and this is one of the uh, commentary i had in in lancet and we can see the only 30 per- 37% of the countries worldwide covering 70% of the global birth have the vital registration system we talk about the civil vital registration system but look at the situation only 37% of the countries has a coverage we are far far behind that when the countries will be equipped 
to have the civil vital registration system so that the estimation of the maternal mortality, estimation of the mortality will be done from the vital registration data. Until then, we are heavily dependent on model-based estimation. These models are performed primarily by the WHO and UN organizations. And from 9, 2008, IHME started also estimating maternal mortality estimation. But this is not on the challenge. This was the publication by the Richard Horton, editor of Lancet. And he asked the question, how many women die in India? One of the reasons was estimation from the WHO for India was the 50,000 women dying every year. Estimation from the IHME was around 72,000. So almost like you see that the two estimations give you a difference of 22,000 different numbers. Which number to believe? If you're a health minister, which number you should pick? And on the right box, essentially showing all the discrepancies between the two models. Particularly, I worked in the two countries specifically for maternal mortality estimation. One is Indonesia, another is Bangladesh, and I will give you some examples and challenges. If you look this one, this is essentially estimation from uh, maternal mortality by the WHO UN organizations. And if you look at the estimation, in 2015, the estimation was 126 for Indonesia. Indonesia has economically improved substantially during the last decade. If you look at the IHM estimation, I have converted both on the same graph. And you can see both of them are very converging almost the same time, particularly on the 2015 period of time. But still, there is a little bit of 50 points difference. But again, if you look at the starting point, if you look at the WH estimation, it will show much less decline. If you take the IHM estimation, it will show much steeper decline. So if you think about the MDG, if you take the top one, essentially it shows the MDG achievement is feasible. On the other hand, if you take the down one, WHO one, then it may not be feasible. Now look at the empirical estimation. The first two were the so-called estimation based on the model. But when you come to the empirical based estimation, 2012 demographic and health survey shows 359 when the estimation was around 250 by the model base. And in 2015, it was a more challenging. Their own empirical data shows 305. On the other hand, model-based estimation was around 129. So again, if you think about, if you're a health minister, and if you're given a number, in a particular this year, your maternal mortality could be 129 or 309. It is a quite challenging. Essentially, so Indonesia asked me to re-estimate the super data estimation so that to find out if we apply the similar type of the demographic and health survey, how the results will change. And I have re-estimated it, and I found it the maternal mortality essentially, if you apply the WHO's method, it is a 237. So their own estimation was a 305. So what is your gaze? What was the acceptable number to the government? 305 or 237? 305. Why? Because 2015 is the base year for SDG. Higher you can show, higher you can show the decline in the subsequent years. And now I will go into uh, estimation with the maternal mortality in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a long tradition of empirically estimating maternal estimation 
from the large survey. Their very first Bangladesh maternal mortality and morbidity survey was done in 2001. Subsequently, the next one is done 2010. And during that period of time, it was found that the large decline occurred in the maternal mortality. And so during the 2016, they decided the maternal mortality has already declined substantially. So they wanted to also include the maternal morbidity module. And I was engaged to help the study team. And very interestingly, if you look at the BMS 2001, around that time, facility delivery was traditionally very low in Bangladesh, only 9% in 2001. And that has gone up to 223. In 2016, that has gone to 47%, rapid increase within six years of so-called the delivery in facility level. Everybody is expecting maternal mortality definitely has inclined substantially because facility delivery is a key determinant of maternal mortality. Look at the result. It precisely remained the same. 322 declined to 2,194. In 2016, it remained 196. Absolutely no change. Now, the key question, we know that when you are here, what is the difference between 194 and 196? But unfortunately, in the papers, in the press, there was a significant discussion that the maternal mortality has gone up in Bangladesh. Government was scared. Subsequently, they essentially decided to, this is in Bangla, fortunately I can read it, okay. <laughs> uh, essentially, it is simply saying, to look, we have a significant concern about the findings, and until we evaluate the findings, do not utilize the results. And the result was essentially, or the report was essentially removed from the government website. Because the maternal mortality was translated into increased from 194 to 196. One of the challenges, maternal mortality in many of these developing countries is still based on the so-called the sisterhood method. Originally, it was developed around mid 80s, around early 80s. Thought was that in the surveys, women are alive. We cannot interview the alive women for the death. And at that time, fertility level was very high. Most of the country, the fertility was around six. So if there is a mother has six children, it is expected that she will have three daughters. If she has three daughters, if one is interviewed and that woman has two sisters, in a different way, by interviewing one woman, we will have two additional samples by interviewing their sister. And so a new method emerged, and that is essentially the sisterhood method. Now the challenge is fertility has gone down. Fertility has gone down to even three. If it is a three, all the women doesn't have any two siblings or two sisters. So still, unfortunately, the maternal mortality estimations are based in developing countries, based on the sisterhood method. And as a result, we have substantial challenges that our confidence interval will be extremely large or the number will be very unstable. And this is the assessment we have done for the demographic health survey. Some of you may know the demographic health survey data are the main source of estimation of the maternal mortality and low middle income countries. <clears throat> and if you look at the right graphs, and you can see the confidence interval is even 40% to 60%. The relative confidence interval is extremely large. And another challenge is that if you look at this, it's a little bit of busy, but I can explain you. If you look at the so-called the, the DHS estimation, and there's a lot of, the sisters are asked, 
whether your sister died from the pregnancy, during delivery, at postpartum period. A lot of time, the women respond, I don't know. If they say, I don't know, they're treated as a, they're basically treated as a non-maternal death. Now, if you take this so-called the don't know as a missing cases, and if you exclude them, like a case deletion cases, then essentially DH is how they estimate. But if you really want to say that those so-called the don't know are missing values, and just as a multiple imputation or single imputation, if you do that, you will see that maternal mortality essentially on an average may increase even 20%. So in a different way, there are several challenges when the sisters are interviewed on, 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 on maternal mortality. Now, if this is the condition at a national level estimation, think about what happens to the sub-national level. We are more interested in the sub-national level for a government, it is a huge challenge to know if I know that, okay, fine, my country has a 500 or 600 or 300, how do I address that? But if I know the subnational level, I will know where I need to target the program, which are the high risk areas, which are the low performing areas. In a different way, subnational maternal mortality estimation is more needed. However, because maternal mortality is a rare event, it is extremely difficult. In a different way, by sample size wise, it is almost impossible to conduct a survey to have the national or subnational level estimation. In this work, which has been published in the bulletin of the WHO, we have done a model based estimation and shown that by simply using a small area estimation type of the modeling, it is possible to reasonably estimate at the subnational level. And still you can infer which are the high risk area and which are the low risk area. If you look at the bottom part, this is a very coastal area, very difficult to reach those areas. It is a very high maternal mortality. On the right hand side, all the red areas has a very high maternal mortality. And these are the area also very inaccessible, very difficult to access or conservatively, very conservative area. In essence, our work has also extended. We in the population of family health, we work for women's health. And family planning is our core foundation. In essence, safe motherhood is the four, some sort of like the four R, antenatal care, delivery care, postpartum care, and the fourth arm is family planning. We have examined the role of family planning in reducing maternal mortality. And our study, in the, which was published in the Lancet, has shown in the absence of the family planning, the global mortality would have been increased by 44%. And in a different way, the family planning has reduced global maternal, maternal mortality rate by 44%. And on the other hand, it additionally it has shown that by reducing the unmet need in the contraception, we can also reduce maternal mortality by another 29%. Now, I will focus on uh, uh, morbidity issues. Among all maternal morbidities, we sometimes say for each maternal death, another 20 to 30 women suffer from maternal morbidities. Among all maternal morbidities, obstetric fistula is the most difficult, most wretchful situation for women. And I presented in the Gynecology and Obstetric International Journal, when it presented as a special edition, we presented them, them as a dead women walking. They're essentially dead, but still they're walking, they're still alive. And one of the challenge is that they bring double tragedy. 90% of those women, when they deliver, their baby is also born a stillbirth. So 
essentially the steel bath and obstetric fistula often occur simultaneously. Now a major challenge remains. What is the global estimation of obstetric fistula? Sometime we hear about 2 million women globally are suffering from obstetric fistula. Another paper, Luval, thought, hmm, maybe 2 million is not too much. I think it is a 3 million. Okay. And another paper, Adler, done some sort of a meta-analysis, and she thought it is a 1 million. Another challenge is that in that particular paper, incidence rate is around 6,000. In a different incidence rate is 6,000, maternal the fistula cannot be 1 million. It means that the woman has to survive 175 years to have that fistula prevalence level. Okay, so something is wrong. But how do you really estimate? This remains a challenge. In many of our publications, essentially, we have emphasized how do you really measure obstetric fistula? It remains a challenge. And particularly those who work in the maternal mortality area, morbidity area, it is quite known that self-reporting of the maternal morbidity condition have a very high misclassification. It's a challenge. Demographic and Health Survey started collecting data on obstetric fistula or in terms of the so-called incontinence, continuous incontinence. And if you look at the right-hand side, and this was the paper we published in the WHO Bulletin, measuring incidence and prevalence of the obstetric fistula, it has gone from the 2% to 0.1. But you see, the major challenge is if you look at the, all the data set, it goes from the 0.1 to 10%. It cannot be 10%. So something is wrong. In a different way, self-reported obstetric fistula simply by the symptom is not enough to detect or to diagnose obstetric fistula cases. In order to do that, we thought that let's conduct a validation study. In the validation study, we'll first find out what is the true prevalence level of the obstetric fistula. In a different way, we will identify the suspected cases from the self-report, then these women will undergo the clinical examination. And once they done gone through the clinical examination, we'll have the sensitivity and the specificity. However, this is a challenge. Challenge in the sense that Again, the fistula is a rare case. It means that we must have a very large population coverage to have a good number of cases. And second problem is, we cannot do this for all the known cases. You cannot really send, for example, a normal woman for a clinical examination who doesn't have any complaint. So ethically, it is not feasible. So we really have to design in a such a way that we can still conduct this study, we can still diagnose the women, and but still done in an ethical way. In doing that, we first do it in a small area because we have chosen a small area because that will allow us to conduct this study more feasible way. And then, from a national level survey, the same questions were asked, and from the self-reported reporting, will adjust their report. And if you look at the so-called, the first study was a maternal mortal morbidity validation study. We have conducted 48,000 48, households, and that household listing has 269 members, and we have identified 65,000 eligible women, and among them, one, we have identified essentially the 58 women Look at after 58, 60, 56,000 women examination or interview, we have identified only 58 women who reported continuous incontinence. 
But to have an adequate also number, to have a control, ultimately we decided to have undergo the 397 women will go undergo the clinical examination. And at the same time, another problem which is often neglected is the so-called POP, pelvic organ prolapse. Pelvic organ prolapse is also is a sequelae of childbirth. Most commonly occurs after childbirth. Only those women who has given a childbirth, this is more prevalent among them. So this is a problem of the childbirth, but essentially safe motherhood program does not take any responsibility for them because this is beyond their purview. So we thought that during this study, we will also look at the third and fourth stage confirmation of the pelvic organ prolapse. So this is essentially the data. If you look at this one, we self-reported about 149 and no about the 248. And among them, 28 essentially was diagnosed positively. And eight essentially say no in the self-report, but also diagnosed positively. And if you look at this type of the data, we can easily calculate the sensitivity and the specificity. But this does not tell you anything about the prevalence level. So from this data, how do you really calculate the prevalence data? That remains a challenge. In doing so, life becomes much more easier if we can correct for the verification bias. If we take into the verification bias, then essentially you can see, we can find out how many cases would be we can really assign to these specific groups. And if you take this into account, I'm a little bit of not going through everything. But you can see that we can add more cases and ultimately, just to come to the main or important point, essentially, the self-reported prevalence was at 23.5%. But if you correct for all these corrections, then essentially the true prevalence level is a 4.83%. So in a different way, by applying those so-called the self-reported sensitivity and specificity information, we can apply those information and essentially get an unbiased estimation at the population level. Once we have that, then essentially we can apply that to the population level estimation or population level self-reported data and come to a national level estimate. And at the national level, essentially we have estimated in Bangladesh, there are 500,000 women having third and fourth degree pelvic organ prolapse. This was absolutely neglected area public health people rarely looked into. Similarly, if you look at the obstetric fistula reporting, and obstetric fistula reporting, fortunately, has a very high sensitivity and specificity. If you look at the sensitivity, it was almost like 100%. If you look at the specificity, so-called the directly observed, it was a 90%. Once you have adjusted for the verification bias, it was 99.7, 99%. Almost like a perfect sensitivity and specific in instrument. So in a different way, once you have that, it is possible. But look at the challenge. The positive predictive value is only 33%. In a different way, when the report not necessarily all of the cases having that type of problem. Only 33% are having the problem, are the true cases. So that implies that if you look at the self-reported prevalence level is 119, very high. And most of the so-called the reported cases, if you look at the, the last survey, essentially all are based on the self-reported cases and all are around that number. But the moment you go into that, because this is converted into the per, hundred, per thousand. Okay, per thousand, so per hundred thousand. So in a different way, the self-reported in almost every country probably has a very similar type of the prevalence in those countries where the prevalence is very high. 
But on the other hand, if you look at the adjusted prevalence level, adjusted prevalence level is quite low. Okay? So that shows that even we know that self-reporting of the maternal morbidity has a low sensitivity, low specificity, and it's quite challenging. And in fact, Hopkins has a long tradition of doing that type of a study. Some of you may know Cindy Stanton. She has done a lot of studies on uh, uh, maternal morbidity and very early studies from international health. It was done also looked into the demographic and health survey, initially started collecting data on maternal morbidity. But ultimately, the study by Johns Hopkins University has shown sensitivity and specificity of those maternal morbidity questions are very low. They decided to drop it. So again, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health has a long tradition contributing scientifically in improving our understanding of maternal morbidity correctly and appropriately. And we have gone to the so-called the national level, and you can see the national level also we have adjusted it, and now the morbidity, the total level is shown. And in case of obstetric fistula, we have estimated that maternal, obstetric fistula in Bangladesh is around 17,000, 17,500. Very interestingly, a very early paper in 2003 that was a report, based on that report, it was self-reported. It was reported that Bangladesh has a obstetric fistula cases of 75,000. So government was essentially scared. Oh my God, 75,000, we cannot handle it. This is beyond our capacity. Because every year, in Bangladesh, only 300 to 400 operations are performed. So at that rate, 90% of these women would never see surgical operation in their lifetime. But when the government look at this value of 20,000, they say, hmm, probably can handle it. In a different way, with the correct figures or with some sort of a reasonable estimate, we can engage the government to be the part of the study and part of the team to address the problem. So in summary, I really want to emphasize this issue very well. The USA, UK, Sweden collected maternal mortality data in late 1800s. And even before that, early 1900s at population level. How they have done it? What do you have learned from them? Absolutely nothing, to tell you very frankly. If we had learned it, we could have translated it to the other countries. We couldn't do it. Still, many of these countries, this is not a one or two or three, vast majority, in fact, do not have any empirically good collected data that can estimate maternal mortality correctly or with a very reasonable so-called the error level. So MMR estimates for many low and middle income countries are based on a statistical model. We utilize a set of covariates and maternal mortality data from other countries. In a different way, they borrow a strain from other countries where they have the data and then they apply. And you see, there are some challenges. It borrow from the countries where the information are available. Which countries have the information? The countries which have data, it means that the country probably has also low maternal mortality rates. So that remains a challenge, essentially. And that's one of the reasons you can see when I was showing you the estimation in, in Indonesia, so-called the model-based estimation was extremely low. On the other hand, the survey-based estimation was quite high. And this is a very common dialogue in the statistics. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So when you apply the model-based estimation, I hope everybody will remember that. Okay. But again, the challenge is not the model, essentially. 
the best the one of challenge is basically even the model specifications are different model uh, some sort of a what variables will be included what will be the specification of the model all are different and results are different now if you are a health minister and i give you the five figures and all five were all over the place it is very difficult for you to pick up which number is appropriate for the country and many of this country direct sister method is used for the maternal and mortality estimation and i really feel like that with fall in fertility level the utility of this method is questionable and i believe that countries must strive if you look at when all this country sweden was not a very rich country definitely in 1800 if sweden could do it why not many other countries now cannot really invest in maternal mortality estimation but however we believe that we can definitely improve the estimation method in a more reasonable way so that we can improve the estimation i don't believe that tomorrow all the countries will have 100% cvrs coverage it will take time and our next sdg sustainable development goal target of reducing maternal mortality to on an average 70 it is almost knocking at the door only 12 years i don't think within 12 years we'll have the cvrs 100% globally sub national estimations are needed for targeting the high risk poor performance area and sub national estimation is a challenge and i think we can definitely contribute and will contribute in improving the estimation and in fact in our department we are working on the sub national estimation even using the bayesian methods and other technologies so that we can have a more reasonable estimation not only for the maternal mortality but also for contraceptive use cpr and those type of estimations for the sub national level and only recently interest has emerged to assess the burden of the maternal morbidity it is a very recent phenomenon in fact in developing countries because all focus was all maternal mortality only recently it emerged self reported maternal morbidity has a low sensitivity and specificity however it is possible to reduce the risk of misclassification bias with the statistical and epidemiological method and estimate what are the guesstimate and as i have shown you the so called obstetric fistula 3 million 1 million 2 million everybody comes with a million okay so in this type of guesstimate i think we need an estimate and we can do it and we must stay for it and at the very end i'm here because of many people's contribution and i really like with this opportunity i like to acknowledge my deepest gratitude to them dr hendy mosle he was my advisor he was my mentor i've learned a lot of things from him Dr. Blum, he's again my mentor. He tremendously helped me in in focusing my career. Amy Choi, always fun, always exciting to talk with her. All the demographic problems, all the demographic issues. And similarly, Donna Estebino, she's very dedicated to the students, and I have really learned how to be dedicated to the students from Donna Estebino. Halida Hanum Akhtar, she is an alumni from Hopkins, and she was my first director, and she essentially encouraged me to come to Hopkins. I am very grateful to her. Scott Jagger has given me the opportunity to work for the biostatistics department and teach a biostatistics course. I am grateful to him, and I am still continuing it. Dr. Baki, he is my elder brother. He is also my mentor. He is also I have learned a lot of things from him. He has a lot of field experience I don't have, and I learn all the time from him. Thank you so much. And particularly, we are professor because of the student. I'm tremendously grateful to our student who has given me the opportunity, who has given us the opportunity to teach them, to make them the leaders, to replace us, to become the next generation of the scientists, next generation of the public health professional. Thank you so much.
reminiscing, uh, or I guess it was yesterday, reminiscing a little bit. We've both have been around for a while, um, and we both took uh, Introduction to Survey Sampling yeah. Ellen Ross um, course, when right? Alan Ross taught the course. And those of you who have been around remember that course. And I couldn't help but think, and so, so Dr. Ahmed is now teaching that course in the biostatistics department, and I couldn't help but think how different a course it is now with your um, incredible experience. No, I think I made it much more simpler. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question or a comment? Or? Yes. I was kind of hoping you were actually able to provide answers instead of asking more questions before the end of your presentation. But it's the opposite. So I guess probably you know more 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 um, years ahead of you to really try to answer some of those questions you um, uh, you know sort of raised here. But almost sort of improving the validity of measuring maternal mortality. I don't know whether you have any you know thoughts about how to do that. I know that Right, but the CDC work have also shown that in the US event, maternal mortality is underestimated. And you probably know that many states essentially has improved the so the death certificate to include the uh, checking of the pregnancy status of the maternal policy. And that has definitely improved the maternal mortality even in the US. However, uh, one of the challenges I think in the developing country because vast majority of women are still delivering at home, dying at home, and uh, we are heavily dependent on the so-called bubble autopsy, right? Even if the bubble autopsy, I think it is a quite challenging. It is a quite challenging to pinpoint the exact diagnosis. The exact diagnosis. So just give you an example. Essentially, if you look at the PPA postpartum hemorrhage, right? By definition, it is a 500 ml. How many women can really if you look at the small bottle of Coca-Cola, it is a 500 ml, like the small one. But it is very difficult. We can precisely visualize what is a 500 ml, right? But for delivery women, for 500 ml is very difficult. And another challenge, basically, I didn't go through all of our study. We've done a study in, in uh, postpartum sepsis, and postpartum sepsis is essentially symptomatic. There is the clinical, uh, some sort of laboratory diagnosis. And with the same top, it's very difficult. One of the challenges basically temperature is high. But when you at the home, you cannot really put thermometer to everyone and they will measure their own temperature. So again, it is very difficult to diagnose and very difficult to uh, those type of challenges are there. I think this is important that we really want to some sort of a, remove the bias from the misclassification. Uh, but again, there, there are definitely some challenges there. Uh, Stan. Here. Thank you. Um, some years ago, I was doing an evaluation for AID of the Peru uh, DHS survey. And we've, oh, in that uh, work, we visited one of the provinces. And the, the provincial medical officer said, I would want to get maternal mortality estimates at the provincial level. Um, and I told him uh, politely that that was a stupid idea. Um, and it seems there have been many, many studies that take hundreds of thousands to get a good confidence interval, and that's not a good use of resources. What I told the medical officer was, why don't you instead do some case uh, studies of women who have died, find out why they died, interview relatives or the, where they were arrived at the hospital. We don't prove maternal mortality is low to start with, so that was my justification for saying there were better ways than t to interview 100,000 women in each district or each province or something. Could you comment on that? Does it make sense, really, given a, la a small amount of resources to put them into a huge survey when maybe that should go into the vital registration, uh, improving vital registration or something, or um, case, case reports is what I was asking him to do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I think this is very important. I mean, think about this. Uh, 
we, we never collect any data and suddenly thought that, okay, I need that many numbers. It becomes a huge burden on covering that large population. Now, there are certain other methods developed. Essentially, I also, I've shown you the one paper to write with the Wendy Graham, and Wendy Graham is the author of that sisterhood method. And one of the methods subsequently emerged is the so-called made in made for. It is a maternal death information from the informants. In a different way, you call all the community health workers, a similar health worker, in a one place, and then essentially ask them, is there anyone in your community died? And from there, you validate that subsequently with the follow-up. So that's a little bit of cheaper method, but cheaper comes at a cost. Everything you really have is cheaper, there is a penalty for that, unfortunately. So in Indonesia, they have a two surveys done with that made in metaphor. And I'm giving a one simple challenge, essentially. So for the maternal mortality estimation, we need the numerator death, and the denominator is a life birth. So they have calculated very some sort of a nicely about the denominator, numerator. When they come to the denominator live birth, government given you two numbers. One is a 3.5 million, another is a 5 million. Now think about it. 3.5 million divided and 5 million, and how the maternal mortality will change. So everything, and that's a challenge. And similar problem is that and this is the concern that that type of the so-called the community health worker will only report those probably the poorer class, they died in the village, those dead in the hospital probably will not report it. So in a different way, you really need to have a comprehensive network that will cover so-called at-home death and at hospital death. Women can only die in two places, either at home or at hospital. And then you can apply some method called the capture-recapture method. And essentially, that paper has discussed about the capture-recapture method. And uh, Indonesia group has also applied that capture-recapture method to correct something. But again, this is not perfect. This is approximate method that will give you some numbers and probably will be happy with it. Any other questions? Yes. Not, not a question, actually, but a comment. You acknowledged all the people that helped you with your program. And speaking for probably half the people on board, and we want to thank you for helping us with your ours. Yes. <laughs> when you have five projects, five projects of your own going on at the time. Whenever we come to your door, it's always open. You always welcome us, and you always uh, save us <laughs> from the statistics involved. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you for that comment. That's great. Um, so please join us uh, outside for a uh, reception. And please uh, join me again in congratulating, congratulating Dr. Ahmed. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So much.